There were three major werewolf films that were scheduled to come out in the year of 1981. I did American Werewolf in London last week. That was the third one to be released that year. I'm gonna do the first one to be released that year. Let's talk about it right now. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are gonna to talk about the first werewolf film to come out in 1981. There was three big werewolf pictures that got released in 1981. Two of which I like, one of which I don't really care for. I'm going to talk about the, the first film to be released that year. This film came out in April of 1981, and that film is The Howling. It's rated R, had a budget of $1.5 million, and upon release it made 17.9. Now, this movie was directed by Joe Dante. Joe Dante had worked for Roger Corman for years, and he had directed Piranha. And coming off of Piranha, he got this film. Now, due to the success of this film, Joe Dante got Gremlins, which was a huge hit. Then he went on to do Inner Space, Gremlins 2, The Burbs, Small Soldiers, so on and so forth. Joe Dante's been around for a long time. He still directs, does a lot of TV work now, and still does a movie occasionally. Um, he's just had a couple films a couple years ago that came out. Um, it, the titles are escaping me at the moment. But yes, Joe Dante is still actively directing. And I've always liked Joe Dante as a filmmaker, and he is a film geek to the highest order. Now, this book was based on a novel by Gary Brandinger, and I've read all three novels. There's Howling 1, 2, and 3, and if you get a chance, read those novels if you're a reader. They're actually really damn good. Now, this book, this movie, takes a lot of liberties with the novel. It changes a lot of things up. It takes the basic premise, and everything, that's about it. <laughs> everything else is different in the movie compared to the book. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not good. I just really like the book. I, I would love to see a true adaptation of the original book so I, I think if they ever remade the howling which i think i would be on board for as long as they kept the effects practical and not cgi i hate cgi cgi werewolf effects suck they always have i've never seen a convincing one yet so i would love to do if they did a remake of the howling which i know they talked about a few years ago stay practical people please it looks better and this film proved that along with american war from london now to write the screenplay there was a screenplay written but joe dante had worked with john sales on Piranha. John Sales wrote Piranha. So Joe Dante took the script to John Sales and John Sales wrote, rewrote the script. As a matter of fact, John Sales rewrote the script for this film right around the same time he was writing the script for Alligator. And John Sales is even in the film. He plays the morgue attendant who has some lines and he's very good in the film. And he went on to be in a couple Joe Dante films. If you ever seen the movie Matinee, which is a great film, he's in that film as well. Um, so let's get into the cast here. We have a huge cast here and a who's who of people that have been in a ton of movies over the years, character actors. We have the great D. Wallace as Karen. D. Wallace went on to be in E.T., Cujo. Um, I'm missing films here. Critters. She's in Critters. She was in a ton of films, still acting to this day, and she's wonderful here as well. Christopher Stone plays Bill. They're married in the film. In real life, they were engaged to be married. Patrick McNee plays Dr. Wagner. He is the psychologist that's on his news on his news network a lot that Karen works for. She's a reporter. And he also, he's had a, if you look at his list of credits, he's been in a ton of things, a ton of films. He was in A View to Kill, which is a Roger Moore, James Bond film. He was in Waxwork, Waxwork 2. His list of credits go on and on. Dennis Dugan's in this film as Chris. He works at this news station as well. He, he actually went on to have a he went on to direct a lot of comedies. He directed Prob Problem Child, Happy Gilmore. He directed a bunch of other Adam Sandler films as well. So, yeah, he went on to be a director. He still directs to this day. Kevin McCarthy, the great Kevin McCarthy, who was who was who plays Fred. He plays the owner or the manager of this news station that Karen works for. And he was most uh, iconically in 1956 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But he's been in a ton of films. He, he was in Inner Space for Joe Dante. Joe Dante liked to use a lot of the same actors over and over and over again. It's one of the other reasons I love Joe Dante. Familiar faces in all of his films. You could pick somebody out. And we're going to get to the main one coming up soon, who's in almost every Joe Dante film, or or was. The man has passed away, unfortunately. John Carradine's in this film, has a small role. Slim Pickens plays the sheriff, Sam. Robert Picardo, who's in a lot of Joe Dante films. He was in um, Gremlins 2, The Burbs. And I know he's most famous for being on Star Trek, one of the Star Trek TV shows. And he plays Eddie Quist. He plays... We'll get into it. And the great Dick Miller is the bookstore owner, and Dick Miller is in almost every Joe Dante film, and Dick Miller is awesome in this film, like he's always awesome in any film he's ever in. Now, this movie starts off with Karen 
is wired up by the police. There's this guy who's been terrorizing L.A. They don't know who he is. He's been leaving bodies in Skid Row. And he's been in contact with Karen. And he wants to meet her in this really seedy porn shop in L.A. And Karen's walking in the street and she goes to this phone booth that she was instructed to go to. And the phone rings and she picks it up and he tells her where to go, what store he wants her to go in, and what he wants her to do. And right outside the phone booth, we get our first big cameo by the great Roger Corman. And she goes to the CD bookstore. And she goes through the store to the back where they have these different booths she can go in and watch a porn film. She goes in, sits down, and all of a sudden his arm reaches around her and pops a coin into the machine and a film starts. And he starts talking to her. Now the cops can't find her because the radio cut out because of all the neon. That's how the cops explain it. All the neon is old technology. And so they're looking for her. They have a patrol car in the area. They know what she looks like. And, and the cops are questioning people trying to figure out where they go. And they do. And Eddie starts t telling Karen that he's going to light up her body. And her body's going to feel like it's on fire. And we can't see him directly. He's standing in front of the projector. So he's backlit. And his face is all in shadow. But he starts shaking. And he's talking. And his voice is getting deeper. And and she starts. she turns around. And what she sees terrifies her. You can tell on her face. The, the emotions on her face. She starts screaming. And the cops are there. And the younger cop out of the two starts shooting. Eddie drops dead on the floor. So Karen is saved. And it's a very traumatic experience. And she starts having weird nightmares. And she's, she doesn't feel safe. And she just do, can't remember anything really from being in that booth. Or what Eddie looked like or anything like that. So the doctor, Dr. Wagner, played by Pat, Patrick McGee suggests to her to go to the colony. He has an experimental like, camp where he sends people that need help psychologically just to recharge your batteries, go to these group therapy sessions, and just relax out of the city. So she agrees to go with her husband, Bill, and they get in the car and they go. And when they get there, we're introduced to all these people that are there. And they kind of know who she is because they've seen her on the news. They, they all say, oh, yeah, you're famous. I know you're from the news, blah, blah, blah. And the first night they're there, she hears this howling. And they tell her it's coyotes. And weird stuff starts to happen. And there's this woman who, Marsha, who lives there, who's very, she's an attractive woman, and but there's something about her. She's off. Very animalistic vibes coming from this woman. She's definitely a predator, for sure. And she sets her sight on Bill immediately. Like, she wants him for herself. And that kind of ties, in the book, it's kind of similar relationship. I don't remember if the, the names are the same, but I think Marsh is the same name in the book. And the same thing kind of happens in the book. So that's another point that's kind of similar to the book, but nothing else really is besides the setting and that plot point. And then Bill ends up getting bit by a wolf, werewolf. We see it. We don't get to see much of the werewolf at this point. We just see little flashes of it. And he gets tore up, and he goes back to the cabin, and they patch him up. And the next night, he goes out, and they he ends up having sex with Marsha, and they both transform into werewolves. Now, the only part... Now, this movie was made in 1980. There's an animation sequence with the wolves by a fire making love. It looks terrible in today's eyes. But you got to remember the time period in which this film was made. And we do see them transform a little bit. Their teeth come out, they start growing hair, and their eyes change. But we don't see the full transformation yet. Matter of fact, they saved the whole full transformation... For a little bit down the line. We'll get to that. And then, so Karen calls her friends from the station, Chris and this other woman who he's seeing. And she comes up without Chris. Chris has to stay behind about pitching the story to um, Kevin McCarthy's character. He said, I'll be up in a few days. You go ahead. Because they start piecing things together. And they're led towards werewolves. But they know that there's no way there's werewolves. And this is where we meet Dick Miller. Because they go to this bookstore and pick up a couple books. Chris and his girlfriend. And... Dick Miller, this is where this plot, this little piece comes into play later. Dick Miller says about, we, I get all kinds of crazy people in here. What do I look like? I'm just trying to make a buck here. I got a guy who ordered these 30-odd um, six silver bullets, never came to pick them up. He goes, I sell all this kind of weird shit. I'm just trying to make money. That's it. And so she, his, her friend goes up there. She goes up there to, to come with Karen. And Karen knows that Bill has probably slept with Marsh at this point. She says she has her suspicions. And Bill's demeanor changes. He starts eating meat, which before he did not. And all this kind of weird shit. And then finally, to fast forward a little bit, we get our first transformation scene. Karen's friend is out by the ocean and realizes they found some pictures in Eddie Quist's apartment in L.A. 
And when you go to the, oh, by the way, I skipped over. When you go to the coroner's office, Eddie's body's gone. This is where we meet John Sell's character. And it's gone. And it looks, it's all scratched up the inside of the door. And they're like, I don't know where he went. I don't know how he would even got out of here. He's, he's dead. Well, we find out werewolves in this film regenerate. Like, if you don't shoot them with a silver bullet or light them on fire, they will regenerate. You cut off an arm, it'll come back. Um, you shoot it, it'll come back alive. And we find out that's true because she gets chased through this cabin, cuts the werewolf's arm off, and ends up in the office of the doctor and she's calling Chris on the phone telling him what's going on and this is where we see our first werewolf full size we get to see the werewolf and I love the design of the werewolves in this movie and I'll get into that in a minute and she gets killed now D Wallace has her character Karen has this um episode and she ends up she really her and Bill have it out a little bit and Bill slaps her and she gets pissed off and leaves and she goes to the same office that her friend was just at, and finds her body, and she's backing up, and Eddie shows up. And the bullets are still in his head where he got shot in L.A., but he's starting to heal. And this is where we, he talks to her for a few minutes, and then he starts transforming. And so it's a long, drawn-out... It's a, it's shown differently than in American War from London. They use a lot of bladder effects underneath the... Make, it looks great. And Rob Bottin, who I know I said in American War, Rick Baker was originally hired to do the effects. He left to do... American Wolf and John Landis, and he left his protege Robbo team behind. Robbo team knocks it out of the park, and the World Flick effects look awesome. His transformation scene with Robert Ricardo looks fantastic, but Karen gets away because she throws hydrochloric acid in his face. She goes away, gets away, but she gets caught by the other werewolves, and she gets taken to this barn, and it's, they're going to kill her because they know she's going to tell people that there's werewolves, and they can't allow that to happen. So Chris shows up, goes into the office, has a, an encounter with Eddie Quist. He transforms back to Eddie Quist, but half his face is melted from the acid. And he gives him the he takes the, Eddie Quist takes the gun off him and gives it back to him because he doesn't think a gun can't kill him. He doesn't know that it's loaded with. Chris stopped at the bookstore and grabbed the thirty odd six rounds that are made out of silver. So he starts changing again. Chris shoots him with the silver bullets and he's dead. So that's the end of Robert Ricardo's character. Chris goes to the barn, saves Karen, shoots a bunch of them. They flee, but she gets bitten in the by her husband bill who turns into a werewolf and she shoots him and she plans to go back to the city and prove to people there's werewolves in a secret society which she does on air transforms into a werewolf chris shoots her and then we got our surprise ending that marsh is still alive at this bar and that's the end of the film and that is the howling i really like this film i've i remember watching this as a kid it used to be on a lot on tv and the, the effects look fantastic, the makeup effects. I said about the animation. There's also uh, one little scene of stop motion that's charming as hell because it's stop motion, but it doesn't look the greatest. And it, they only linger on it for a second, though, so you barely notice it. The animation scene is probably the worst effect in the whole film. But it's a really well-done film. It's well-acted. It's well-directed. Joe Dante does a fabulous job directing it. I like American Werewolf, the story, a little bit better, but... I. And I love Rick Baker's effects, but I like the werewolf on two legs better than all down on all fours. I always have. Don't get me wrong, I love the werewolf in American Werewolf in London. But I like the design of this werewolf. This is my preferred design of a werewolf on two feet. And I think the werewolves look really cool in this film. Although I don't think the film is as good as American Werewolf in London. Um, before I get into my rating, I'm going to give you a couple, a little bit of um, trivia here. Robert Picardo, when he goes to transform, he goes... There's a scene, right before he starts transforming for Karen, he goes, I want to give you a piece of my mind. And he starts pulling a bullet out of his head from when he got shot in L.A. That was improvised on the spot. Like, Robert Ricardo just said it before he did it, which is really cool. That's a great line. Forrest J. Ackerman, you could see in the bookstore scene when um, Chris and his girlfriend go there for the first time when they meet Dick Miller. He's walking around looking at stuff, and he's carrying, actually, a copy of his magazine, Famous, Far Famous Monsters of Filmland. So yes, Forrest J. Ackerman's in this film. Um, this film was filmed in 28 days, which is a pretty damn quick shoot, especially for makeup effects, the transformation scenes, all that stuff. Um, the second werewolf film to come out that year was Wolfen. That came out in July. I don't really care for that film. But that movie was the other, well, it's technically a werewolf film. I guess you'd consider it. And then American Wolf in London came out in August. So we had three werewolf films in 1981. I was only two years old, so I didn't see them until much later. And actually, Howling 4, which is not a great film, but that's actually a more faithful adaptation of the novel than this film. It's just a little... It's not a great film by any stretch. I know they got screwed on budget. I think their budget got slashed by like 60% before they started filming that movie. 
But yes, Howling 4 is technically a more faithful adaptation, but I'd love to see a remake with the original novel. But I would give The Howling a 9 out of 10. It's a fantastic werewolf film, one of the best ones of all time, definitely in my top five. Um, yes, 9 out of 10 for me for The Howling. Have you ever seen The Howling? What are your thoughts on it? Leave a comment down below. Let me know. Hit the thumbs up. Share this video. Hit the subscribe button as well. I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. I'll be back soon with another review. See you later. Bye.